This is a defense of Ash Wednesday. Why? Because every year, without fail, starting about a week or so before Ash Wednesday, Sola Scriptura thumping Protestants start screaming in real life or on social media about how Ash Wednesday is unscriptural, about how it violates Jesus' command to fast in silence and in secret. Today we're going to go over how Sola Scriptura thumpers are wrong and need to actually read their Bibles. That may sound harsh, but frankly I'm sick and tired of the attacks on Ash Wednesday and Lent we see every single year like clockwork. As I'm going to demonstrate, Ash Wednesday is all over the Old Testament. I'm sure someone like Scott Hahn or Brant Petrie could do a more thorough defense of Ash Wednesday, as they are theologians, but still even I found it obvious. So buckle up, we're going to dive into sacred scripture. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, we hear God tell Adam, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Those, as most of you are aware, are the words the priest uses when applying the ashes to your forehead. Or if you're unfortunate enough to be at a modernist parish, the extraordinary Eucharistic minister doing the same. The ashes are a reminder of our mortality. Remember, Lent is a season of penance and preparation for the passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord. It's a symbol of the fact that after the fall of Adam and Eve, after the commission of the first sin, we are subject not only to suffering, but also to suffering and to death. Thanks to Adam's brilliant decision-making skills and those of his wife, we are mortal and we return to dust and ashes after death. Next, in the Old Testament, we come to Job chapter 42, verse 6, where Job tells the Lord, Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Obviously, this adds to what we're seeing. Dust symbolizes mortality and repentance from sin. Symbolically, then, repentance is another meaning for the ashes, on top of the recognition of our own mortality. If you think this is a fluke, let's check out the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 3, where Daniel is praying for his people. While praying for others, Daniel recognizes how utterly worthless he is on his own by his own saintly words, I, Daniel, turned my face to the Lord, seeking him by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. In ancient Judaism, in times of prayer and penance, the faithful would wear uncomfortable, scratchy clothing and wear ashes to symbolize their penitential state. This seems alien to us today because we hear so little about being repentant for sins even from the church, where our leaders choose instead to accompany us in our state of life, instead of reminding us that we are dust and to dust we shall return. It is strange that Ash Wednesday remains on the liturgical calendar at all. Then again, it isn't a holy day of obligation, so there is that, I suppose. But this gets more interesting. In 1 Maccabees chapter 3, 47, verse 47, we see the symbolism appeared again. And yes, I know, Sola Scriptura thumpers side with Luther and Calvin and his law of bandits against the wisdom of the councils that assembled the Bible. But still, the point stands. That verse of Maccabees says, They fasted that day. They put on sackcloth and sprinkled ashes on their heads and rent their clothes. So the ashes are on the head in the Old Testament, as well as the wearing of uncomfortable clothing. And then there's the book of Esther, Esther a personal favorite of mine in the Old Testament. As an aside, prominent women in the Old Testament are typically types of Our Lady. The giveaway is that they usually behead or crush the heads of their enemies. Rather consistently, in fact. On to the text at hand. Esther, chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, says, Esther, the queen, seized with deathly anxiety, fled to the Lord. She took off her splendid apparel and put on the garments of distress and mourning. And instead of costly perfumes, she covered her head with ashes and dung. And she utterly humbled her body. And every part that she loved to adorn, she covered with her tangled hair. And she prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel. I, for one, am glad that the church doesn't include dung on Ash Wednesday. So far, we see a consistent theme, though. Upon entering into an intense period of prayer and penance, the faithful puts on uncomfortable clothing and puts ashes on their head. The practice was obvious for the Jews before Christ. Anyone wearing sackcloth and ash was entering a period of intense prayer for penance for their sins and to intercede on the behalf of others. Now, you might be tempted to say that it's not scriptural because Jesus banished the old law and traditions. Not true, at least in this regard. Let's have a look at the New Testament. 
in Matthew chapter 11, verse 21, we see the practice very much alive and well in our Lord's day because we see in his accusation against the cities of Galilee after they rejected him, he, him saying, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Our Lord seemed to recognize this practice for what it was. In both the lesson for the traditional Latin Mass on Ash Wednesday and the first reading in the Novus Ordo for Ash Wednesday, we see Joel chapter 2, verses 12 to 18. Even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. It is a call to repentance for your sins. Now, you might sound, that might sound like a contradiction, but it's not. God does not merely want the outward sign. He wants our repentance for sins. The outward sign is meaningless without repentance. It goes back to the central theme of the gospel, where our Lord offers salvation, but always tells the sinners he spends time with to go forth and sin no more. An interesting effect of fasting is what it does to the mind. In our lax days of hedonism and luxury, most of us only fast on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. It's one reason I'm thrilled that the observance of the Ember Days is making a comeback, which will be the subject of a future video. Because we aren't used to fasting, when we do it, we become aware of what we're doing, and hopefully, why we're doing it. It's why my video on keeping a good Lent was about not being mopey and depressed. We hear a lot about mindset these days, almost to the point of it being a cliché. But you can think of this as the Daniel or Maccabean mindset. During those times of fast, reflect on what you're doing and why, especially if you added a sacrifice to the Lenten fast like most people do such as from caffeine or the dopamine hits associated with Twitter or whatever. But let's go a bit deeper. While this won't satisfy any Protestants out there, for Catholics who care about the messages of Our Lady, we also hear a constant theme. Penance, penance, penance. It was at Lourdes that we saw the request to kiss the ground as acts of penance. We saw at Fatima that many souls go to hell because no one does penance for them. Remember this Lent that one of the points of the mortifications undertaken on Ash Wednesday and beyond are as acts of penance for the conversion of poor sinners. In our age of apostasy and sexual immorality among the clergy, those acts of penance are needed now more than ever. It is not too late to add a mortification to your Lent either. Last year, three days into Lent, I decided to give up secular music. This occurred to me while I was at the gym when I always listen to music. It can be done and can be very, very fruitful. In closing, remember the purpose for our fasts and the ashes we wear. We need to stay grounded in what the season is about. And perhaps we understand now why the Eastern Rites of the Church and the Orthodox call this Great Lent. Have a blessed Lent, and thank you for listening and for your support. If you want to support my work, there are options in the description of this video. I ask that people continue to pray and do acts of penance for the liberation and exaltation of the Church. I'm Anthony Stein, Viva Cristo Rey.